Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Listen, Tracy, (laughs) we have really had some downers lately, some murders. Yeah. Not the most fun topics going on. Uh, Yeah, last week's recording session was particularly grim. Which is great, because this week we've kept it pretty late. Uh, We both have been promising some more fun stuff, which we are delivering on. I went marching right back to eponymous food, because to me it's the gift that keeps on giving. (laughs) It's fun. There are weird side streets you can go down. It kind of hits all of my curiosity points. And so far I have not discovered a murder involved in any of the food. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) So today we are going to cover a super yummy comfort food from Italy, and two dishes with a lot of debate as to their origin. One of them is associated with the U.S. East Coast and one on the West Coast. All of them, in my opinion, are delicious. Uh, If you think there's nothing quite so delicious and comforting as a giant bowl of fettuccine Alfredo, I sure love it. We'll (sighs) talk more about that on Friday. Uh, You're not alone. Although, if you were to order this by name in Italy, people might give you an odd look. This dish would normally show up on menus in Italy as fettuccine al triplo burro. The fettuccine with three butters. Uh, You might see this as fettuccine al burro or fettuccine alla crema. And the beauty of this one is really its simplicity. The story of its origin is known really well. This starts with a family with a husband cooking for his wife. In 1908, Alfredo de Lelio was working at the family restaurant that was a little trattoria in Piazza Rosa in Rome, run by his mother, Angelina. And 1908 was a very big year for de Lelio because he and his wife, Inez, had their first child, Armando. But as the story goes, after Armando was born, Inez was very sick. She was quite weak. She had no appetite. And Alfredo, understandably, was very worried about his wife. So, the restaurateur tried to make her something that would appeal to her palate and stimulate her appetite and give her some energy. Maybe a tall order. He made a bowl of fettuccine and then added in butter and parmesan. And then, according to the Delelio family legend, he prayed to one of the patron saints of mothers, which was St. Anne, and then presented his wife with this dish and told her that if she did not like it, he would eat it. He did not get to eat it. <laughs> Not only did Inez love it, she thought that her husband should add it to the restaurant's menu, and he did, and thus one of the yummiest foods of all time was born. So this was surely not the first time that somebody had combined pasta, butter, and parmesan, but there were some aspects of Alfredo's version that were a little different than other Italian dishes that have similar ingredients. We'll talk about that secret in just a moment, uh, and some other aspects of his dish that would have separated it from those other precursors. Alfredo opened his own restaurant in 1914 in Via della Scrofa, and he simply called it Alfredo. And he continued to build on the success that he had already achieved and his reputation for exceptionally delicious pasta. He also started to get the attention of hungry diners from well outside of Rome, as wealthy tourists, some very notable, started to visit his place. A lot of travelers from the United States landed in Alfredo's during a tour of Europe in the early years of his restaurant. Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford famously visited Alfredo's restaurant on their honeymoon. That was in 1920. And they loved it so much, they reportedly ate there every single day that they were in Rome. Prohibition in the U.S. contributed to a bump in tourism in the 1920s as American tourists sought out vacation destinations where they could get a drink with their meals. In 1927, Alfredo was knighted for the excellence of his fettuccine. In an interview Delelio gave to a journalist at the time, he said this was because he always used the very best ingredients to make his pasta, even in the most difficult times. Quote, during the war, he said, I found a way. He was not especially secretive about what made his way of dressing fettuccine special, saying, quote, double quantity of butter and cheese and well-mixed, that is my secret. (laughs) Yeah, so his secret was just more. Yeah. (laughs) More of the fatty things that make it delicious. Uh, We'll also talk about how he made his noodles, which is a little different, too. 
Uh, Alfredo was really, really proud of the name that he had made for himself and of his dedicated and impressive patrons, noting in that interview, quote, kings, princes, ministers have eaten here. The crown prince of Sweden is one of my patrons. The journalist conducting the interview, Alice Rowe, wrote of his tableside manner, quote, people go to Alfredo's not only to eat his delicious fettuccine, but to see him prepare it after it has been cooked. A waiter brings it from the kitchen. Alfredo approaches with a spoon and fork as though advancing to a sacrificial rite. He poises fork and spoon aloft aesthetically and then begins to mix into the fettuccine a generous supply of the best butter and grated Parmesan cheese. But even beyond disclosing his double the butter and cheese secret, Alfredo gave Ro the entire recipe for his fettuccine noodles as well. Here it is, quote, Sift upon the mixing board a kilo of fine white flour. Make a hole in the center of the mound of flour, and into this break seven eggs. Then with your hands, never with a spoon, gradually work the flour into the eggs until no more can be assimilated. Then add a tumbler of water and a dash of salt and gradually knead the entire mixture into a smooth paste. Work it thin, and when all is perfectly smooth, roll it into a thin sheet. Then cut the paste in narrow strips a third of an inch wide. This is enough for eight persons served abundantly, or nine served cosy cosy. Enough. He recommended boiling his homemade noodles for exactly eight minutes and leaving them damp instead of draining them dry. He said that he used an eighth of a pound of butter for each individual serving. That's half a stick of butter. And, quote, an ample sprinkling of Parmesan cheese, finest quality. Of the utmost importance, according to Delelio, is mixing the butter, cheese, and noodles so every noodle is evenly coated. Yeah, for anybody that hasn't made pasta, that amount of eggs is a lot. (laughs) It means that your noodles are very, very rich in flavor. And an eighth of a pound of butter, a half stick of butter is a lot to put in one serving. (laughs) Uh, That same year that that write-up appeared, again, that was 1927, uh, and it was in numerous papers because it was picked up and syndicated, Alfredo also received a very lavish gift from Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford, a solid gold spoon and fork set that were modeled after the ones he used to toss his fettuccine for guests. On the handle of one was engraved, To Alfredo, the King of the Noodles, Mary Pickford, July 1927. The other had the exact same inscription, but had Fairbanks' name instead of Pickford's. And according to the official history of the family restaurant, those words were, quote, read by every famous person who had the honor to taste the Mestosissime Fettuccine. Mestosissime means most majestic, and that is the name of the dish on the menu even today, La Ver Mestosissimo Fettuccine dal Alfredo. Alfredo and his delicious pasta started getting mentions in international papers. That drew even more visitors. Before the 1920s were over, restaurateur and writer George Rector had included the recipe for Alfredo de Lelio's famed dish in his cookbook, The Rector Cookbook, All that press, plus the cachet of having movie stars tout the dishes as exceptional meant that soon everybody wanted to try fettuccine Alfredo. And Delelio definitely leaned into his public persona and his growing fame. He really understood that showmanship was part of growing his business. And if you do an image search for him online, you're likely going to pretty quickly find photos of him feigning to feed guests his fettuccine by the handful. That was sort of part of a shtick that he developed as the tableside show of having your noodles dressed. It looks a little squirrely to me to have someone like with a fistful of fettuccine. But even so, it was really always, always about the food. As he told a reporter, quote, I've always been more interested in perfect cooking than anything else. In 1943, the tourist trade had evaporated thanks to World War II. Alfredo decided to retire. He handed the restaurant off to his son Armando, whose birth catalyzed the invention of this famous dish. Armando took on the moniker Alfredo II as the business passed to him. In 1946, the Via della Scrolfa restaurant was sold to two members of the staff. But just a few years later, in 1950, Alfredo I and Alfredo II had another restaurant, this time called Il Vero Alfredo, the real Alfredo, and they opened it in Piazza Augusto Imperatore. 
That restaurant is where you can order most majestic fettuccine, and it is still there and still run by the family. It is currently run by Alfredo I's grandson and granddaughter, Armando, who goes by Alfredo III, and Inez de Lelio. The Via de la Scrofa location is also still open. Those two restaurants are kind of competitors. You may have noticed the dish, as originally made by Alfredo, was really simple, just butter and cheese. And that's not typically how you would make it if you looked up the recipe today, particularly here in the U.S. Most recipes you'll find will probably have heavy cream in them, but that was never part of the original version. And this is simply due to differences in ingredient availability. As fettuccine Alfredo caught on in the U.S., it just didn't quite have that delicious richness that it had in Italy. And there were a few reasons. For one, Alfredo de Lelio as we said, made his fettuccine from scratch, and his recipe had more egg than most, using a hand-ground wheat flour, and that gave it this layered, deep flavor. Additionally, the butter he was using was richer than what would normally be available in most North American grocery stores. And, of course, the cheese. Alfredo was using Parmigiano Reggiano. It's Parmesan cheese, but just as champagne is a sparkling wine from the Champagne area in France, Parmigiano Reggiano can only come from particular parts of Italy. Its ingredients are specific, and it must have been aged for between one and three years. So to approximate the richness of flavor of all of those ingredients, fans of Alfredo's dish outside of Italy added other ingredients just why we have heavy cream usually in American versions. And today, it's actually pretty simple to acquire Parmigiano-Reggiano in a grocery store in the U.S. You'll also find garlic on the list of ingredients in an Alfredo sauce, but that's something that Alfredo de Lelio would be really livid about. In 1955, an article appeared in papers across the U.S. under the title, Cooks in Rome Deny Garlic is Italy's Favorite. This quoted several prominent Italian chefs and restaurateurs who were just beyond irritated that there was a rumor that Italians ate copious amounts of garlic. He insisted that garlic did not come within a mile of his signature dish, and of the rumor itself, he said, quote, it's a lopsided ragu and has to stop. Alfredo de Lelio died of a heart attack in 1959 at the age of 77. And in the U.S., National Fettuccine Alfredo Day is celebrated on February 7th. We are going to move on to a dish that's often associated with brunch, but before we do that, we'll have a minute and pause for a sponsor break. The next eponymous food we're covering is a little tricky because it's not clear exactly for whom it is named, although there are many contenders. But we can tell you for certain that Eggs Benedict is not named for Benedict Arnold, even though that seems like a pretty common misconception that people make. Although there are many, many variations on this dish, the base recipe for Eggs Benedict calls for Canadian bacon and poached eggs sitting on top of the two split halves of an English muffin with a generous drizzle of hollandaise sauce to top that all off. So before we get into the debates over who Eggs Benedict is named for, let's talk first about hollandaise, just to get that out of the way. Hollandaise sauce, or a sort of proto-version of it, dates back at least to the mid-17th century. In the cookbook, Le Cuisinier François, François-Pierre de la Varenne, gives the basic recipe, although his lacks lemon juice. In a recipe for asparagus in a sweet sauce, he writes, Make a sauce with very fresh butter, a little vinegar, salt, nutmeg, and an egg yolk to thicken the sauce, being careful that that doesn't turn. As an aside, this is from the Terence Scully translation of that cookbook. There are others that may have slightly different wording because the translation is just a little different. Uh, Today, a hollandaise would include lemon juice and perhaps even cayenne pepper. But it was probably around even before that. That name, hollandaise, means Dutch sauce, and it's believed by some to have traveled to France via Huguenot, who were returning to their home country after having been exiled. There's a difference of opinion on that last point, though. The sauce is sometimes attributed to Normandy as the place of origin and to the town Isigny specifically. That town is known for its butter. And you can find the same recipe listed in some places as sauce Isigny. It became known as Hollandaise thanks to prior podcast subject Auguste Escoffier, who listed it in his book as the fifth mother sauce, 
Although his predecessor and another podcast subject, Marie-Antoine Carême, had also used it and called it that, Carême did not list it as a mother sauce. One possible reason for the change in name to hollandaise sauce may have been as simple as the change of butter source from using butter that was made in Isigny to butter that was made in Holland. So getting back to Eggs Benedict, one claim to the name origin of the dish is stockbroker Lemuel Benedict. Benedict was successful and a ladies' man and a bit of a dandy when it came to his appearance. He was not a man who buried himself in work and laid low in his downtime. He was from a wealthy and conservative family, a family which did not appreciate the fact that Lem was kind of a New York party person, very outgoing with a very flamboyant style. If you've ever seen photos of wealthy folks out in the cold wearing a raccoon skin coat, Lem was one of those. He also allegedly carried a cane that had a flask built into it. So no surprise, based on that description, Lemuel Benedict had a reputation for fun. Waitstaff in the restaurants that he frequented loved him because he tipped really generously. He was seen about town with a variety of beautiful dates, and sometimes all of that partying caught up to him in the form of an epic hangover. According to the Lemuel Benedict version of the Eggs Benedict origin story, one morning in 1894, he sat down for breakfast at the Waldorf Hotel, and he was feeling the previous night's indulgence. And so he ordered a variety of breakfast items, buttered toast, two poached eggs, and some bacon, and also a pitcher of hollandaise sauce. I paused because I'm just thinking about how if I had a hangover, this is not (laughs) at all what would help me. Once Lemuel had been brought his order, he said to have assembled the items into two stacks and then poured the sauce over them. So according to this tale, he invented this himself at his table. When Oscar Shirky, the maitre d' of the hotel, saw what the stockbroker had put together, he duplicated that in the kitchen and found it to be delightful. So subbing out an English muffin instead of the toast and Canadian bacon or ham instead of bacon... That went on to the menu. That version of the origin story was repeated by The New Yorker on December 11th, 1942, in an article written by Thomas Dorimus and Russell Maloney that was simply titled Benedict. At that point, Lemuel Benedict was still alive. He had married an opera singer named Carrie Bridewell in 1908. He had known all manner of famous and important people. And according to The New Yorker, quote, Benedict's has been a full and happy life. He gave uh, an interview for it as well, and he died the year after that article came out in 1943 at the age of 76. He apparently never transitioned over to the English muffin version of Eggs Benedict. He always preferred toast. And in that article about him in The New Yorker, he gave the quote, English muffins are unpalatable, no matter how much they are toasted or how they are served. Disagree. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, There is, of course, a different story to how this dish got its name. In 1978, an article ran in Bon Appetit about the dish, and in that story, there's a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Le Grand Benedict, for whom the dish is allegedly named. In this case, this was invented at Delmonico's. That's a restaurant Lemuel was said to have visited frequently, but this attribution actually predates the Lemuel Benedict uh, story by about 30 years. And this version is one which Delmonico's continues to assert is true. In 2018, the Delmonico's head chef, Bill Olivia, told a reporter, quote, What I know is simply that Mr. and Mrs. Legrand Benedict came all the time. They had eaten everything on the menu, and they were tired of the menu, and they asked the brothers to create something new. In this version of the story, the chef at the time, Charles Ranhofer, conferred with the brothers who owned the restaurant, and they all came up with this dish. So, Ranhofer had published a cookbook in 1894 titled The Epicurean. This had an Eggs Benedict recipe in it, although it was called Eggs a la Benedict. That recipe reads, quote, cut some muffins and halves crosswise, toast them without allowing to brown, then place a round of cooked ham an eighth of an inch thick and of the same diameter as the muffins on each half, Heat in a moderate oven and put a poached egg on each toast to cover the whole with hollandaise sauce. Yeah, and that the spelling of that, in case you couldn't hear, is different. It's not Benedict with a T on the end, but Benedict, D-I-C-K, is the end of the name. So that only muddles the story a bit more. 
For a long time, a very long time, Lemuel Benedict's family, primarily his cousin's son, Jack Benedict, really advocated for Lemuel to be recognized as the originator of the dish. Jack Benedict also operated a restaurant in Colorado for a while called L.C. Benedict Restaurant and Tavern, and he offered both Lemuel's version of the dish with bacon and toast and Oscar's version with ham and an English muffin. So here's a tidbit for a little extra intrigue. Those two stories share more DNA than it initially appears. Oscar Shirky worked at Delmonico's as a waiter before moving on to the Waldorf, and it's believed that he and Charles Ranhofer worked together for at least some period of time. So it could have been a recipe that he already knew or that he remembered once he saw Lemuel Benedict put something similar together. We'll never really know. Shirky, who may be the subject of a future episode, never confirmed or denied the Lemuel version of the story during his lifetime. Yeah, that 1894 year is the key one where there's both the Delmonico's recipe book and the invention at the Waldorf. Uh, So it's a little fuzzy. There is, though, also a third and much older possible attribution of the name. Pietro Orsini, better known as Pope Benedict XIII, was said to have been put on a dietary regimen of toast and eggs because of chronic digestive issues, and he is said to have added a lemon-based sauce to the otherwise rather boring dish. This version, devised during the time that Benedict XIII was head of the Catholic Church, that was from 1724 to 1730, is of course lacking the delicious bacon or ham component, and was, like Lemuel's, on toast instead of English muffins. This was probably not called Eggs Benedict either. Incidentally, the word brunch first appeared in print in 1895 in a Hunter's Weekly article in which author Guy Berenger made a case for a meal that offered an alternative to the usual traditions of early breakfasts or heavy Sunday dinners. He advocated that brunch was, quote, cheerful, sociable, and inciting. It is talk compelling. It puts you in a good temper. It makes you satisfied with yourself and your fellow beings. It sweeps away the worries and cobwebs of the week. Uh, This article was printed with a PS that read, quote, beer and whiskey are admitted as substitutes for tea and coffee. Barringer might be shocked at just how heavy brunch menus have become over the years, but the timing of this article and the timing of the Lemuel Benedict story being so close together might explain how the egg dish became such a brunch standard. April 16th is, incidentally, Eggs Benedict Day. I'm going to mark it on my calendar, and you better believe I'm making some. (laughs) You can have it all. Woo! And I will. When we come back, we will cover another eponymous food. It is a salad and involves some seafood, and we'll do that right after we pause to hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. Next up is another food with a hotly contested origin story, and that is Crab Louie. You might see it spelled like Louis with an S or Louie with an E, but it is the same dish with either spelling, and it is pretty much always pronounced Crab Louie. It starts with a bed of iceberg lettuce, and on top of that is usually a combination of tomato, hard-boiled eggs asparagus, and crab. Some people also like to have lemon wedges. But the crab is dressed in Louis dressing, and that is where the magic happens. One very popular but now defunct San Francisco restaurant, Solari's Grill, described the crab and dressing preparation this way, quote, take meat of crab in large piece and dress with the following. One-third mayonnaise, two-thirds chili sauce, small quantity chopped English chow chow, a little Worcestershire sauce, and minced tarragon, shallots, and sweet parsley. Season with salt and pepper, or keep on ice. Uh, Chow chow, if you don't know, that's a pickled relish. It is fairly certain that Crab Louie popped up on the West Coast, because it has historically been made with Dungeness crab, which comes from the waters off the West Coast of North America. But exactly where it started depends on whose story you believe. There are several, although these ones mostly lack the level of detail some of our other food origin stories include. So the first version we're going to look at is the Washington State origin. There are two versions set there. One is pretty easily disproven with a quick fact check. So that one claims that Crab Louis existed in Seattle before 1904, 
That date is used in a story that Enrico Caruso, the operatic tenor, visited Seattle on tour that year and ate at the Olympic Hotel. Sometimes this is told with the Olympic Club as the location. Uh, In this story, he was served Crab Louie and then immediately was enamored of it. He's said to have kept ordering more and more of it until the kitchen ran out of ingredients. But the problem is that Caruso was not in Seattle in 1904. He actually never performed there. This version, though, doesn't offer any clues as to where the name would have come from. The second Washington State version places Crab Louie's origin about 270 miles east of Seattle, in Spokane, Washington. There, the Davenport Hotel opened in 1914, and it had Crab Louie on the menu when it opened. That was named for the owner, Llewellyn Louie Davenport, who moved to the Spokane Falls area from San Francisco in 1889. The Davenport, incidentally, is also still around, although it is now the historic Davenport, and it's part of a bigger hotel group. And they still serve Crab Louie, and they keep their dressing recipe a secret to this day. San Francisco lays a fairly serious claim to the invention of this crab salad with pink dressing. A menu from a restaurant called Berger Frank's Old Poodle Dog from 1908 had crab leg a la Louis on the menu. It got the name from the chef Louis Coutard, and then Coutard had actually died before the restaurant opened, so this was probably named in honor of him to keep the public associating his established name on the San Francisco food scene with this new eatery. But calling the old poodle dog new is not entirely accurate. So the old poodle dog was a sort of phoenix from the ashes story. There had been a poodle dog restaurant before the earthquake and fires of 1906, which we have talked about on the show before. Bergay Frank's old poodle dog was a joint venture of several restaurateurs who had lost their businesses in the fire. Louis Cattard had made a name for himself as the head chef at Frank's Rotisserie. The other burned restaurants that had been reborn in this collaborative effort were the Berger and the Poodle Dog. Another San Francisco restaurant also laid claim to the invention of Crab Louie, and that was Solari's Grill. That's the one that we mentioned at the beginning of this segment. The year 1910 is sometimes mentioned here, but the first time we can prove it was served there was in 1914. Regardless, though, that link to Louis Coutard would have been already established at that point. Yes, so that seems a little late. Uh, Food historian Erica J. Peters, who wrote the book San Francisco A Food History, gave a talk at the San Francisco Public Library in 2014 about the origins of Crab Louie. Uh, You can actually find that online. She talked about Louis Coutard and the belief that he had actually started using chili sauce with creamy mayonnaise to dress crab way back at Frank's Rotisserie even before the earthquake and fires, although that dish was not yet named for him then. In 1919, another San Francisco chef, Victor Hertzler, wrote the Hotel St. Francis cookbook. In that, he included a variation on Crab Louie, which he called Crab a la Louise. His recipe directs cooks to, quote, use small, fancy fish plates or salad plates, lay on each plate some slices of the white hearts of firm heads of lettuce, Lay on top some canned Spanish pimentos using the brilliant red variety, which is sweet. On top of this, place the crab meat, taking care not to break it too small. Overall, pour French dressing made with tarragon vinegar, well seasoned with freshly ground pepper. That version obviously switches out chili sauce for pimentos, which is probably why Hertzler shifted the name to Louise instead of Louis. An earlier variation, published in the Pan Pacific Cookbook in 1915 to coincide with the Panama Pacific International Exposition, made another switch out. That one calls for ketchup instead of chili sauce. There's another contender here, though. That is Portland, Oregon. In 1912, the Portland Council of Jewish Women's Neighborhood Cookbook featured a recipe for Crab Louie. This one just had lettuce, hard-boiled eggs, and crab meat. And the Louis dressing is a little different. That is three tablespoons of oil, one tablespoon of vinegar, half a tablespoon of ketchup, two teaspoons of Worcestershire sauce, paprika, salt, and a tad of English mustard. 
Famed chef and cookbook author James Beard believed that the dish probably wasn't invented in Portland, but it was at its finest in Portland at a restaurant called The Bohemian that he frequented. And he included this dish in his cookbook, Hors d'oeuvres and Canapés, as well as subsequent books, making little tweaks to the recipe each time. So, the earliest written evidence for Crab Louis' origin does indeed seem to be San Francisco in the nod to Louis Coutard. But the dish spread in popularity really quickly in the early 1900s. Holly found a 1915 newspaper ad for a Thanksgiving feast in Bakersfield, California, almost 300 miles south of San Francisco, which featured Crab Louis as one of its offerings. So by that time, that was well known enough to be considered a draw for holiday customers. That was, incidentally, at the St. Francis Cafe. Different, apparently, from the Hotel St. Francis in San Francisco, though the proprietor was named Louis Allen. There's so many Louis. There's a lot of Louis. <laughs> there are also some uh, theories that you'll see that it was actually named for Louis the Fourteenth because of his exceptional love of food. But we don't have any evidence that it actually existed then or that anybody named it specifically after him. I did not find any sort of international or national day that's Crab Louie Day, but that seems like a horrible oversight on on the world's part. <laughs> uh, every day is Crab Louie Day. Um, I love talking about food. I have so many things to talk about in the behind the scenes on this one, including an idea I had while we were reading. Okay. But before we do that, I'm going to do a listener mail. And this is from our listener, Zach, who writes, Hi there and Happy New Year. I loved y'all's recent episode about snowflake photography. While listening to it, I remembered an odd book of water crystal photos on my art shelf, but I couldn't recall if it was by Bentley or not. Then when I went to have a look, it was so much weirder than I remembered that I felt I had to share it with you. These are photos taken of individual water crystals formed after being exposed to various stimuli, such as music, semi-plausible, and abstract concepts such as beauty, truth, etc. Somehow, I think this whole concept fits rather nicely into Bentley's worldview. I can almost imagine him writing about this project in a scientific magazine. I'm attaching a few pictures for your enjoyment, also one of my cats. Johnny is 17 and an operatic countertenor, among many other professions. Here he is reading Sherlock Holmes stories. There's another cat, Ruby, an intrepid tripod tabby, but she does not like to have her picture taken. <laughs> I hope y'all are having a lovely holiday season and that 2022 starts off with ease. Thanks for keeping the podcast going. Zach, thank you so much because one, adorable kitties, but two, this is very cool. And I think you're right. I think Bentley would be delighted as heck over these strangely stimulated ice crystals. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, it kind of reminds me of the experiment that you we have all probably seen pictures of online at various points where uh, spiders were given various different um, drugs or stimulants oh, sure. and then they did their webs. It's like that, except it's ice. Uh, there's no actual animal involved of any kind, but it's very fascinating. If you would like to write to us with fascinating things or just mundane things that you think might be interesting to us, that's cool. You can do that at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History, and you can subscribe to the podcast on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.